This program is dedicated to those that paid for their lives at the hands of the state. Studios of WKTV. Let's go inside for Silent Voices. Hello and welcome to another edition of Silent Voices. Today, Brian Downs sat down with a group of grandparents to discuss what happens when grandparents try to adopt in the state of Michigan. Let's go to that interview with Brian. Hello, I'm your host Brian Downs and in this episode uh, we have uh, several grandparents that are here to discuss the issue of what happens when grandparents or relatives in particular uh, try to adopt uh, their uh, relatives or their grandchildren after they have been uh, removed from the home by the state. Uh, our guests today include uh, Jose and Marguerite Garcia, Dennis Lawrence, and Sally Borghese. In general, the, the question we want to discuss is, why is a, a fit grandparent or relative denied the right to adopt their grandchildren or nieces or nephews even uh, if they don't have a criminal record and they're a fit parent? Uh, it really doesn't seem to make any difference uh, whereabouts in Michigan you live or which court you're in. Uh, the uh, result seems to be the same. Very often it's uh, the relatives are denied the right to uh, adopt their, uh, rel their um, relatives. Um, so what we'd like to do today, uh, we have a, uh, uh, we're going to have a discussion. We've got a number of quick questions we'd like to ask uh, these grandparents who have personal knowledge of what happens and uh, to try to get a, a, a quick overview of what happens uh, in these situations where relatives or grandparents want to adopt their children. Uh, the first uh, uh, part of, uh, is a first question is a four-part question we'd like to ask about. Actually, really a five-part question. Uh, one is, uh, what are the uh, what is the name of the grandchild that uh, you had experience with in the court system? Uh, which court that you were in? Uh, when, what year the course, court case began, uh, how long did it take to be denied the adoption of your grandchild, and uh, who or where did the denial come from? So uh, to start off with, um, uh, Marguerite, could you answer those first five questions in general? Yes, um, we were in Kent County Court, and our case started in 2004. It took three years for us to be denied, and the denial came from Michigan Children's Services by the director of the agency, Bill Johnson. And uh, uh, Marguerite, uh, in, uh, would you like to uh, mention your grandchild's name? Okay. Yes, there are two grandchildren. Um, one grandchild is Joshua Garcia, he was three years old at the time. And then there's also Alyssa Sandoval Garcia and my son, Micah Garcia, and his wife, Ophelia Garcia, were in the process of adopting Alyssa Sandoval Garcia, which is um, Ophelia's first cousin. So she was six years old at the time. Okay, uh, Dennis? You... Well, our case uh, came out of Kent County court system. It started in 2007. Um, our two grandchildren, Sabrina and Fantasia, 
which we had um, had them in our home for 10 months, uh, although we did not have a foster care license, but we did um, take care of them after they had been in three different foster's home, foster homes in the first uh, year. So we had them for 10 months and then the agency decided they wanted to move them with a newborn baby that was uh, uh, a couple hundred miles away in northern Michigan. Um, our denial came about a year and a half after we applied for adoption um, from Bethany Christian Services. We did not have the finances to pursue this further into the court system. Okay, um, thanks Dennis. Um, Sally, would you like to answer the questions? Sure. My, my uh, granddaughter's name is Rio Marcella Borghese. She was five when they took her. And it was the Kent County Circuit, 17th Circuit Court that uh, our case was involved in. It began in the year 2004 and ended um, probably midway through 2006. The denial to adopt my granddaughter came from Bill Johnson, the superintendent of the Michigan Children's Institute. Okay, thanks, Sally. Uh, now, it seems like it's an obvious uh, uh, answer for most people that if uh, a child has to be removed from the home, the obvious solution is to place the child with a fit relative and especially a grandparent. So, the uh, next question is, uh, for the grandparents, what was the reason the state uh, was fighting against your adoption of your grandchildren? Marguerite? In my case, the basic reason was we supported our son and daughter-in-law and the grandchildren. We're pretty sure if we would have disowned our son, they probably maybe would have let us have them, but because we supported our son and daughter-in-law, that's probably the main reason why they denied us. Uh, thanks, Marguerite. Uh, Dennis? Well, we had many um, excuses, and, and um, they were very pitiful. Uh, one was the support of our uh, child, who was the father of the children. Um, he was a special needs boy, and he, uh, he did need a little help, a little guidance. Um, and um, another reason was uh, they made up the reason that my wife would take care of uh, two other grandchildren when we had the other babies in the home and they said it was a chaotic situation. I turned around a year and a half later and I, I seen Bethany Christian Service had a special on TV about a mother that a single mother that had adopted eight children, so I could imagine how chaotic her home was. Um, they also had cited that my wife was on the abuse and neglect registry. We had several papers ran in 2005. She was ran twice when DHS had given us uh, Fantasia earlier in um, Fantasia's life and she was not on there. In 2007 we ran her on the registry again. She was not on there. In 2008 she was not on the registry. It turns out that they had put her on the registry in 2009 when we had tried to adopt and um, they had backtracked that to 1998, 10 years uh, later. Um, so so there, there was several just pedal excuses that the agency had used on um, our case. Oh, okay. Uh, thanks, Dennis. Uh, Sally, what was the reason in your case? Well, my granddaughter and I had lived together from her birth. Um, till they took her from me um, at the age of five years and 33 days. Um, during that time, of course, um, uh, 
DA Blodgett was our, our contracted agency through, social, uh, through C Child Protective Service. And um, I believe that maybe I asked too many questions about what was going on in the case and, and why this was happening or that was happening. Um, because it seemed that the caseworker was just taking a dislike to me and up, um, being upset um, by my um, questioning. Um, when it comes to my grandchild or anybody that um, is in our family, I would like to know the answers. I also think that my granddaughter, because she was born with a um, uh, foreshortened right femur, um, that made her a special needs child. And of course, she would bring the highest federal funding to the agency. So I think that played a big part in it, too. Uh, thank you, Sally. Now, uh, as a little bit of background on the next question, question we'd like to ask the grandparents, um, is the, uh, the, the situation or the, the way we uh, decide adoptions here in Michigan. Michigan is, is unique, as far as I know, among all the other states uh, in the United States. In most states, a family court judge will decide uh, uh, where the child is going to be adopted out to or who's going to adopt the child. But here in Michigan, we have what we call the uh, uh, Michigan Children's Institute. And there's uh, one person who's the uh, uh, superintendent of the Michigan Children's Institute. Uh, his, in Michigan, his name is Bill Johnson. And he's the sole person who gets to decide uh, or approve uh, all the adoptions. Um, so this is a very unusual situation that Michigan appears to be the only state that that does this, and it puts an awful lot of power in the hands of one person. Uh, at any one time, Mr. Uh, Bill Johnson has about 3,000 children um, uh, in, in a backlog, or children that he's uh, in the process of uh, approving adoptions for. Uh, the only remedy uh, for um, uh, trying to appeal a decision by uh, Mr. Johnson, the superintendent of the Michigan uh, uh, Children's Institute, is what they call a Section 45 hearing. Uh, now, the Section 45 hearing uh, seems to be a very difficult hearing to, uh, to win an appeal in, uh, since the uh, standard is uh, very strong um, uh, to, to win in that case. You have to prove that the, his decision was arbitrary and capricious. So back to the questions for the grandparents. Uh, let's see if we get answers to these questions. Uh, one, did your case go to the Michigan Children's Institute Superintendent Bill Johnson? Uh, did you fight the decision in what is termed a Section 45 hearing? Or if your case did not go to the superintendent, did you peti petition to adopt? So, uh, Marguerite? Yes, the answer for us is all three. Um, we did go to Bill Johnson. He is the one that denied our adoption of Joshua. They had already adopted out Alyssa quite a while before this because the adoption had not been finalized for my son and daughter-in-law to adopt Alyssa. So they stopped that and they, she was adopted out to another family. So we tried to adopt Joshua, our grandson Joshua. And we did go through the Section 45 hearing and um, we also did petition to ad adopt Joshua. Okay, uh, thanks, Marguerite. Uh, Dennis? Well, we, um, as in all cases, this did go to the superintendent. Although we were denied, we wrote a letter um, of interest to him and contacted his office to no avail. Um, so he went with the agency's decision on the adoption. Um, we did not have the financing to uh, uh, start a Section 45 hearing, which is very expensive. Uh, I've heard of several grandparents spending upwards of $40,000 fighting this and even more. Um, and we did petition to adapt through the agency of Bethany Christian Services. Okay, thank you, Dennis. Um, uh, Sally. Yes, um, our case did go to um, 
the uh, Michigan Children's Institute and the decision by Bill Johnson um, was denied. Um, I did fight the, the Section 45. Um, it was, the, the petition um, to adopt is part of the Section 45, and so um, D.A. Blodgett provided Bill Johnson with um, what they had as far as the case background, and um, in most cases, the superintendent just um, sort of rubber stamps an agency's uh, decision to deny um, or approve an adoption. And when it comes to grandparents uh, in the state of Michigan, um, there are very few that get to adopt, if any. Uh, thank you, Sally. Uh, the next question we'd like to ask is, uh, do you have any contact, do you get to visit your grandchildren, or do you have any other kind of contact with your grandchildren? And also, uh, where are your grandchildren uh, living now? Uh, Marguerite? Um, no, we haven't seen Joshua or Alyssa since they were taken by the state. And that's been nine years ago now. Um, the only kind of contact that we can have is I can drop off gifts for Joshua at Bethany Christian Services and they're supposed to give them to him. So I give Joshua gifts and letters and cards and pictures and try to keep him updated on, on what's happening in our family and whether he really gets everything or not, I don't know. But every two weeks, I drop off gifts for Joshua at Bethany Christian Services. Okay, thank you, Marguerite. Uh, Dennis? Well, um, I, am, I don't see my grandparents, or my grandchildren. Um, and my grandchildren are living in Grand Rapids, and thanks to uh, people with their eyes open and social media, I found out where they are living, and um, I do get updated pictures of them. Okay, thanks, Dennis. Uh, Sally? Um, no, I don't have any contact with my granddaughter. I haven't ha um, been able to uh, see or talk to her for uh, over eight years. And she lives in Hastings um, with an adopted family. Uh, thanks, Sally. Now, uh, a final question, uh, since we're drawing to the end of the uh, episode. Uh, we'd like to ask the grandparents if you have any more thoughts, uh, final minute uh, thoughts uh, that you'd like to express to the viewers on, uh, on the process. Uh, Marguerite? Yes, in our case, Alyssa had um, a hot water accident burn. And the hospital, the doctors, they made up lies that she had broken bones and that she had bruises all over her back. And they hid all this medical evidence from us that showed she did not have any broken bones. She did not have any bruises on her back. And then the adoption agency also added another big lie that that the parents had poured boiling water all over her hands and burned her hands up. So we, piece by piece, have gotten the medical evidence to prove that those are all lies. She did not have her hands burned. She just had the initial hot water burn. Um, she never had any broken bones. She never had any bruises on her back. So this is all a violation of the 5th and 14th Amendments of Due Process. This is corruption by our government. This is evidence tampering and obst obstruction of justice. And it really is an abomination of justice. Uh, thanks, Marguerite. Uh, Dennis? OK, um, my thoughts are Grandparents don't have any rights. We had a CASA worker and, and the people from Bethany Christian, they, they come in and they act like you're, you, 
their friends. They get as much information about your family as possible, and then when they write their book, they um, they twist everything. Okay, thanks, thanks, Dennis. Uh, Sally, uh, your comments. Um, <clears throat> well, uh, all I can say is that. Uh, people like our CASA volunteer and uh, her pediatrician and her preschool, etc., were all in favor of my adoption of my granddaughter. But Blodgett um, basically was after the federal funding, and my granddaughter is gone because of that. Okay. Uh uh, I want to thank the, uh, our guests, uh, Marguerite and Jose uh, Garcia, Dennis Lawrence, and Sally Borghese for uh, all this helpful information, and thank you for uh, viewing the show, and uh, uh, thanks for viewing. Well, let's go to a video from Legally Kidnapped that ties into the grandparents saga. Where'd the children go? To foster care. Let's go and watch the foster child. Once upon a time there was a happy loving family. We are a happy loving family. I love you mom, I love you dad. You are the best daughter I could have ever hoped for. They were as happy as happy can be, until one day, when Dad was off fighting the war, little Jane fell off her bike and scraped her elbow. Mommy, Mommy, I got a boo-boo. Oh, you poor dear, what happened? I fell off my bike. Well, let's clean it up. So Mom cleaned up the boo-boo, put a band-aid on it, and made it all better. There it's all better. It doesn't even hurt anymore. Can I go back out and play now? Of course you can. So everything was all better until the next day when little Jane came back from school. Hi mom. Hello dear. How was school today? It was great until the teacher started asking all of those questions. What questions? About how I got this boo-boo. Well I'm sure that they were just concerned. I wonder who that is. Hello, I am a child protective worker. Well, what on earth would a child protective worker be doing here? We got a call from the school saying that your daughter got a boo-boo. I was sent over to investigate. She fell off her bike and scraped her elbow. Likely story. Did you take her to a doctor? Whatever for. It was only a scratch. Well, it could get infected. She could need a tetanus shot. It was only a scratch. And what if she broke something? She sold that had x-rays, and it must have hurt. Did you give her any pain medication? She didn't need anything. She scraped her elbow for crying out loud. And you get angry so easily too. You beat your daughter, don't you? No. Of course not. Where the hell do you get off a quiz in me of abusing my daughter? I'll need to talk to Jane alone. So you can tell me the truth, do your parents beat you? No, never. I don't believe you. Your mother can come back now. You are a terrible mother. I'm going to take Jane away. The hell you are. Get out of my house now. So the child protective worker left, then at 2 in the morning. I wonder who that could be at this hour. I am here to take your daughter to a foster home where she will be safe, and I had the cops with me so there is nothing you can do to stop me. No. You let the child protective worker take her or you will go to jail. Please don't take my baby. Too bad, you are a terrible mother. No don't take me away from my mother. It's okay Jane, nobody will ever hurt you again. Nobody has ever hurt me anyway. I don't believe you, let's go. So the child protective worker took Jane to a foster home. This is Jane, she's your new foster kid, goodbye. Hi Jane, I want to go home, there is something wrong with you if you want to go back to that horrible place. I should take you to a shrink. So the foster mother took Jane to see a shrink. Doctor, there is something wrong with this kid. What is the matter, little girl? I want to go home. I know what is wrong with her. She is depressed. So we'll give her Prozac. That will make her hyperactive. So we'll give her something for that. By the time Lee was done, 
The doctor had put little Jane on ten different medications, and little Jane went into a drug-induced haze, totally unaware of her situation, and there she stayed until she turned 18, when she was kicked out on her own, which is where I just happened to come into the story. I'm on my own, I'm withdrawing from my meds, I have no place to go, I'm tired and hungry. Hi there, I'll do whatever you want for five bucks. I'll give you four. Deal. What are you doing here, Zippy? Jane was then taken to a mental hospital, where she lived for the rest of her life, and I never saw her again, but I will remember her always. Thank you and have a good night. Thank you for watching the show today. If you have any comments or you'd like to be a guest on our program, you can email us here at miparentalrights at gmail.com. That's miparentalrights at gmail.com. We also have a social network that I like to see you join, and that's miparentalrights.ning.com. That's miparentalrights.ning.com. Until next week, remember, your voice can make the difference.